Uh, my name is Adrian Cadet. I'm good troublemaker, educator, one of the five co-hosts of Black on Black. Yeah, um, I mean, my organization, Three Dreads in a Bald Head, or Be More Community of Three Dreads in a Bald Head these days, doesn't necessarily function like uh, an organization. It's a, uh, it's a way to communicate to people that we organize ourselves around ideas that we have passion for, projects that we want to put into the world, and we do uh, whatever we want. Um, for the world to understand that translation, we have to have labels and things like that. So um, for the two main things that we do do, um, they were in-person events. So we pivoted um, to do them virtually um, and have at least a representation of the initiative or the idea or the energy of that in-person reason we gathered um, and a, a kind of placeholder uh, for when it happens we needed to do it virtually and so we were able to use some of our resources to figure out what that would look like. The first year was a little bit more challenging than the second year. Uh, the first year we were we were we we actually were left to do kind of nothing. Um, not knowing um, what pivot looked like or even understanding that word <laughs> and how often it's been used recently. So I know that um, it took us a minute to figure out, it took me a minute to figure out like what could I do? Um, and so by year two, um, put together something virtually for one of our events, the Walk with Excellence, which is a celebration of black high school graduates. And we were able to kind of create a video where we wanted to make it kind of this like love letter to graduation, to who graduated in 2021, and then put it out into a space for people to watch and celebrate in, in uh, whatever way they uh, wanted to. Um, and then this year we were able to go to an uh, in-person model that had a little bit of a hybrid take on it that we think will uh, be a legacy of the pandemic moving forward. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of organization. And sorry, the answer to the question is incorrect. I did receive lots of support uh, from the same place I always receive support from. Uh, friends, family, community members who donate um, to what we do. Uh, whenever I um, am asked to do something that does get compensated. I ask folks to donate to uh, either the Walk with Excellence or the Dr. Michelle Walker Scholarship Fund, but otherwise um, I am the funding model. I mean, growing up in this city, you know, I've derived so much pleasure and engagement and and a source of inspiration and you know triggering thoughts of what to do how to do it from energy of in-person gathering i mean there was a time my parents had one of the first black owned businesses in the city and so there was a time where um, it, and as much criticism as ottawa takes for whatever we take it for there was a time when you did know all the black people. They were all from the same family and uh, families, a group of families that hung out together. Uh, and we, we saw each other mostly on the weekends, rarely during the week, but um, during the weekends. And that weekend gathering was your culture and your cultural connection. 
It was your connection to all parts of the city because it didn't matter where you lived. You were coming to this one central place to be together for this celebration, this event, this moment in time, uh, this thing that somebody in the community created. I think that without that energy, we, we were, you know, for a minute, we were a little lost as to how do we recreate it. Uh, we found some substitutes and I, I did out the gate uh, benefit from some of those innovative ideas of how to substitute that energy or get something similar, right? Like about to do this party on Zoom. Okay, uh, you know, it was, it was good. It was good to see people in that kind of way. I just noticed that as this has stretched a little longer, it's no longer as satisfying to only be in a virtual space with people. Yeah. <laughs> It has taken away something a little bit special. And I think that that's also what's laying inside of that connection with young people, that we've been distant from them already in some criticisms, but um, the pandemic then made the distance between those who have things that young people need um, and the young people that need them, it made that distance even greater. So unless you were doing your, like you had to dig, you had to find. But I also think that we generated some incredibly special new things that um, um, made, you know, I think I can say that that's one of the jewels that has come to our community as a result. So I know that a space, um, where we're looking for something beyond just a hair salon or a grocery store. Now we have people who have identified that, you know, I want my driveway done. Uh, I want um, a massage. Uh, I want a black owned gym. I want a, a black owned delivery service. I want uh, an electrician who, you know, like all of these expanded ways that we hold black businesses to be um, is now, um, I think, the collective work of the pandemic. People coming together, desperately looking, uh, and then knowing that this is also taking place during a racial reckoning. So, you know, you're, you're trying to find safe ways to be in your space. I. I think about the video of um, the black family who called a plumber and a dude in a big truck with a Confederate flag at the back shows up to do the work. And, and, and the husband, he's like, I'm not even going out there. And the wife just stood at the door. She's like, thank you. I mean, we're, we're not interested in you coming into our home to do work. And I mean, the guy kind of looked at her like, I, I don't understand what, what could be the problem. And she's like, well, hell no, I'm not letting you come in here with your Confederate flag, flying ass into my house to fix my toilet. It's not happening. Got it. That's an extreme example. But many people had those like just very basic thoughts of, is it possible that there's a snow clearing company that's owned by a black person? <laughs> it's possible. And you found it. It's true. Is it possible that uh, a, a black guy is a plumber and he speaks French? <laughs> yeah, actually, it, it's not only possible, it's reality. Um, and so I thought that that was an incredible enhancement that was amplified during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, taking advantage of the outdoors, I think that's one of the things that we, you know, especially in a country like Canada, where we, um, we're not maybe as fond of winter, um, but if you wanted to get over what normally happens in winter with people just being like depressed, <laughs> Uh, on, a good, on a good winter, and now you, your winter is tagging into being isolated at home for 
extended periods of time not contacting people then you know zoom is one way but you could just get outside um so i watch black people become unlikely hikers unlikely bikers unlikely to do what we claimed were all of these other things that like weren't meant for us apparently to just enjoy our lives and now folks are removing some of those barriers and saying well you know what race cannot be applied to this because it would already is a concept that doesn't make sense in the way we <laughs> hold it at all but now i'm applying it to where i can go and what i can do in order to enjoy my life and that is like a horrible thing so now that we have sort of pushed on that particular thing some more then i'm, I'm just hopeful that folks will continue to push yeah i actually think that they they work together your organization if it has no young people if when you look around your organization and and there are no teenagers or children or young adults present then um you you i i think your organization's survival is at threat if you do not have a secession plan for your leadership then it means that the folks in your organization are not actually able to see themselves as leaders. I think that then that creates, uh, that kills your uh, creative energy or your innovative spirit um, because it's going to be, become a dominant culture kind of conversation within your organization. I mean, I'm, I've struggled with this conversation about black people as resilient. It, it's like giving in to the part of the, that conversation that says that I'm built to be oppressed. <laughs> that I have to always find a way to get over it and get around it and still be successful. I actually think we're all of those things without any of it. Like, we're just like everyone else we have folks who are excellent we have folks that are mediocre we have folks that are shit <laughs> it's just true we're not special particularly for those things and when we are given the same opportunity to compete as everyone else you're right you better watch your ass you in trouble might be why you made the rules the way you did so we don't have to actually compete with us directly <laughs>